Hello, everybody, and welcome to the talk, which uh, has a title that may surprise some of you respect to what was previously announced. Uh, I, my working title was Highly Advanced Python Undocumented Internals. And then I uh, did sufficient research to confirm uh, to myself the fact that all of this is actually extremely well documented. Python has never really tried to hide its internals from prying eyes or from users. Everything is very much exposed for your use. And so instead of highly advanced, I demoted myself to slightly advanced. It's stuff that's always been there. It's uh, well documented. I'm basically just, just summarizing it all in one place. And it's all solidly documented and solidly supported in every version of Python. So from this point of view, there's absolutely nothing against you using it. Uh, this is the URL from which you can download uh, the PDF. It will be repeated at the end so you don't have to jot it down. So as usual, I indicate uh, what audience level I'm addressing on the uh, three-point scale of uh, Shuhari. Um, this is slightly advanced. The stock assumes uh, better than average uh, uh, master level, uh, sorry, journeyman level understanding of Python. It doesn't really address any of the upper, mo most deep and complicated master level issues, which is why it's only slightly advanced. So what, are, what can you be looking forward to? Well, first of all, uh, a talk on Python 2.4. Just about everything I say is perfectly valid in 2.5 as well, and to a vast extent in 2.6, uh, which is going to be out in the second beta tomorrow. Uh, I just make one point, uh, which is something we've been looking forward to very long about Python 3000, also known as 3.0, which is also going to be out in the second beta tomorrow, obviously not ready to use for production work, but uh, still very interesting to see what's coming our way in the near future. So what am I going to talk about? Well, I'm also indicating the number of slides per subject, so you have a reasonable idea of how important the subject is in the economy of the talk. It's a very broad, not so deep talk, because I'm covering five subjects in an hour, six. Um, so I'm mostly going to talk about the class statement, and meta classes mostly in order to understand exactly how does a class statement work, uh, attribute lookup, and how that plays with descriptor objects, uh, and bytecode inspection and generation, with a little uh, intermediate part on introspection, garbage collection, and, and stack frames and tracebacks. There's sometimes some confusion if you have to dive even a little deeper into the internals, uh, stack frames uh, and tracebacks uh, um, are kind of interacting with each other. We'll, we'll explain that a bit. So let's start with the class statement. So the class statement can be explained very simply. Whenever you have class name, open paren, basis, and then a body, what happens is that Python, first of all, executes the body essentially as if it was a function, more or less, function without arguments. Um, it creates the local, local dictionary of, uh, of the function, uh, the dict with all the, essentially, a, any name that is assigned a value in the body. Assigned a value means uh, left-hand side of an assignment statement also means uh, uh, def and class and import, those are the statements that bind a value to a name. So it collects it all into a dictionary, finds the meta class to use, we'll see how, and uh, it finally it calls the meta class with three arguments. The string, which is the name to be used, the basis, a tuple uh, of, of objects, the dictionary, which has just been built up by executing the body, and binds that in exactly as if there was an assignment statement to that name. So where does it bind it? Well, if it's a module level statement, then it will be a global variable of uh, the module. If it's inside a class, it will be a variable of the class. If it's inside a function, it will be a local variable of the function, and so on and so forth. So let's uh, 
look at an example of a class body and how that builds the dictionary that we're using uh, right after to uh, build up the class object. I'm placing that into a function so that I can have one argument. Uh, any of you from Philadelphia? I hope this little bit of fun doesn't offend anybody. Almost, anyway. I guess everybody, even not from Philadelphia, knows what I'm referring to, that I, I should have passed a second argument for the kind of cheese, but uh, I, I, I think using anything but Swiss cheese is, is wrong. So this, this particular thing only makes for a sandwich uh, with, with Swiss cheese. And of course, steak. No vegetarian sandwiches here. So basically, a couple of statements, a, a conditional uh, control uh, guarding uh, another assignment statement. And then, that's pretty unusual to see in a class, but it's absolutely harmless. It doesn't alter the dictionary in any way. It prints the locals dictionary. So if I, I can call it without argument, so it defaults to plenty, and with none, uh, to basically make this if fail. And we can look at the two dictionary. You can see that the dictionary the class is going to use has a value for onions if this has been assigned, but otherwise it simply lacks it. So there is absolutely no special rules. Uh, I've heard people coming from other languages refer to this as a class declaration. It's, there's no such thing. Python doesn't do declaration. Python has statements, stuff that executes, does thing, not stuff that just tells some abstract entity what's going on. So there's absolutely no rule that says you can't have an if or a while for that matter. All that matters is what are you binding to what names. Now, a second reason I wrapped it into, into um, a function is that this makes it very easy to disassemble. So consider this a foreshadow of the last part of the talk when we're going to dive deep into, into bytecode. Um, I basically consider that looking at the bytecode, with, even with a minimal level of understanding, um, helps you understand what's actually going on inside of Python because it's, it's generated in a pretty simple-minded way. There's no funky optimizer doing weird things. Um, so here's a function constructing a class that's much simpler uh, than the simple example, because even a few lines of Python typically become dozens of, uh, of lines of, of bytecode. And this is the disassembler that basically gives you back the bytecode from just about any executable object, but functions are the most convenient for that. So here, here is what this function does, starting at uh, line three, which is basically where the class. So the constant x, the name you see, and then object to, turned into a tuple of one item, because the bases are always a tuple. And then a constant is loaded, which is a code object, which is basically just like for a function, execution always happens to bytecode. So this has been built into bytecode before getting executed. Basically, uh, this matters because if you have a class statement inside a function, um, that the, the internals of that class statement get compiled once at def time when the outer function is compiled. So it's having a, a factory kind of thing um, is very effective. You, you're not recompiling the, the class statement over and over. It only gets, gets compiled once. So then this is made into a function with zero arguments. So note the code object is a constant. The function is built from it because it needs to know how many arguments it has. And then call function with zero arguments. And now build class does the end of the magic, which is basically uh, what we've, uh, we've seen, uh, finding and calling the meta class. We'll, we'll get deeper into that. Whatever build class leaves on top of stack is stored into local variable x. And then this is the implicit return none at the end of, uh, of the function, since it doesn't have an explicit return statement. It loads the constant none and then returns it. So since we did mention that code object, uh, that's what actually the body of the class turns into that's important. It's one of the constant in the function in the code object of the function, and specifically it's number two, the, the third one. And so we can disassemble it 
in this case, we're disassembling a, a code object rather than a function, but it works in exactly the same way. And so I'm printing it just to show what all the, all the constants are. There's none, which is always the first constant in every such table because it's so widely used, then the name x, and then the code object. And the disassembly is, first of all, the name, under, under, name, under, under, or as I always pronounce those things, dunder name. Dunder name, the global, is loaded. That is, the module's name, and it's uh, stored into the name dunder module. Every class object has a dunder module, which is the name of the module in which it has been defined, and this is how it's uh, obtained. And then the, the code itself, which you remember was just x equal 23, loads a constant, which is worth 23, and stores it into a name that is y. And then load locals and returns it. So the locals dictionary uh, of uh, built up by this uh, um, code is returned. And it will have one the, the entry uh, module and the entry y, and that's all. So we have a dictionary. We have executed the body. We have a dictionary, which is the locals built by that body. Now what? Uh, now we need to find the meta class. Uh, first of all, there's a very explicit way for the Python programmer to tell the Python compiler uh, and runtime uh, what meta class to use. It is simply to set, as part of the dictionary that, that the class body is building, dunder meta class. That basically means uh, you write something like uh, dunder meta class equals type. You're saying use type as my meta class. That's the ordinary meta class for normal uh, new style uh, classes. If you haven't explicitly set down the meta class, then we try another thing. We look over all the bases. And for each base, we get its type, that is, its meta class, same thing. And the, the meta class is just the type of the class. And we get the leafmost of these objects in, a, in an inheritance tree. So if uh, you have, for example, type and a subclass foo of type, then the meta class uh, resulting from this will be foo. Foo inherits from type and therefore is leafmost in this uh, uh, DAG. If there isn't a leafmost class, meta class of course, that is an error, a runtime error that you will get diagnosed. If you ever want, if you're working in a complicated multiple meta class, multiple inheritance situation, and want automatic fix edge for the no leaf most meta class issue, look at the very last recipe. It's about uh, 14 pages, I think, in the second edition of the cookbook, where we really worked out a very general purpose system for that. Uh, you will not normally find yourself in such a complicated situation because it really emerges only when you're using uh, meta class from multiple different frameworks and doing multiple inheritance from classes that come from different frameworks. And that has all, all sorts of other implications. But at least, if you want, you can do the resolution of the no leaf most meta class problem. What if there aren't any bases? What if I just have class foo colon with no bases at all? Well, then, next thing, I look in the module. That is the global of the module. Is there a dunder meta class there? If so, that's what I use. So for example, if you want all, all of your uh, classes without bases to have to be normal new style classes, that is, uh, use type as their meta class, uh, the simplest way may be to start your module with dunder meta class equal type. And then class foo colon, class bar colon, class bars colon, these will all be new style classes because they will all be using type as their meta class, a more common approach is to uh, make sure point two applies by inheriting from object. That's exactly equivalent because type of object is type. So you're using that as the meta class. But uh, this works fine too. If none of the above conditions apply, then by default of the default of the default, we use types.class type. Uh, the old style classes, the bad, ugly, inefficient, deprecated, legacy style classes. Why? Because we care about backwards compatibility. But it would be totally absurd to use them in any new code. 
if you've written any code in the last uh, five years, I hope you're not using legacy classes because there is absolutely no reason to and a lot of reason to use new style instead. Finally, we have the meta class. We want the class, which is an instance of the meta class with appropriate parameters. How do we instantiate it? We call it. Uh, whenever note that this doesn't just apply to meta classes, it applies to all sensible objects. When I call M, I'm not using the dunder call special method of M. That would make no sense. I'm using the dunder call of the type of M. Right? So basically, this is the, the clear rule, infallible rule, that special methods always come from the type and never from the instance, and therefore, if you're uh, calling them on the class, they always come from the meta class. If you're calling them on the meta class, they come on the meta classes class, and so on, is the sharp conceptual difference that makes new style classes work so much better than, than legacy one. Um, in particular, almost invariably, uh, your meta class will be an instance of type. So the meta class of the meta class will be type. Uh, and type under call does two-step construction, which is a very important idiom in many circumstances. Basically, do the construction first, and if that's given a satisfactory result, then do the initialization. You normally don't need to focus on the construction part. You can basically start with already constructed but empty object and just do the initialization. The construction is done by dunder new, and the initialization is done by dunder init. But the initialization is guarded so that if dunder new returns anything that is not an instance of the type you're instantiating, then Python doesn't call your, your init. This is very important because, for example, uh, it lets you play all kind of tricks uh, um, in a mock-up situation. When you're, when you're doing unit testing, uh, you can basically, you just need to, to alter the dunder new appropriately and everything else gets tested properly except the dunder init, uh, without the dunder init uh, possibly playing havoc with the object you want to use for your mocking. That's one of many examples. So this is a great system, but this is where I, for an instant, uh, talk uh, wistfully about uh, the beauties of Python 3. Um, it's not perfect. It's got some, some limitations that we've suffered under for a decade. Um, the class body is executed before we have any idea what the meta class will be. Well, not we as programmers, maybe, but the Python runtime. Because the first place Python will be looking into to find a, a potential meta class is the dictionary, which is built by the class body. So first of all, the class body needs to run to completion. So there is no way you can write a meta class that in any way controls or interferes with the execution of the class body. The class body also is executing the same way, which is conceptually very simple, very nice, but quite limiting in some cases, particularly before, uh, because everything you do in the class body ends up in a dictionary. A dictionary does not preserve order. So the order in which you've done things in your class body is basically thrown away. You only so you cannot tell if it was A equal 1, B equal 2, C equal 3, or uh, C equal 3, B equal 2, A equal 1, or any other of the six permutations. You may well end up with exactly the same dictionary. So for example, you cannot use, no matter how smart the meta class, you cannot uh, just use a, a class to map uh, the, the, the equivalent of a C struct, which has fields in a very specific order. You've lost the orders. You, you, you see all sort of designs like uh, having a, another member which remembers the order. Uh, dunder order equal A comma B comma C or, or, or something like that. Uh, but that is really unpleasant to have to say twice because the code you write does have an order. In those rare cases where you want the order to be significant, it would be nice if you could just make a smart meta class which basically doesn't destroy the order in which you're executing things. So we've relieved that in Python 3000. Uh, get the beta, maybe tomorrow when beta 2 comes out, because uh, it's beta 1 now. Um, get the beta, try it out. First of all, the first uh, 
innovation, and of course, like all big innovations, is extremely simple, it is now possible uh, to define the meta class as part of the um, class clause. So you can have class name, open paren, basis, comma, meta class equal m. You have a keyword parameter named meta class that you can pass. And then if you do that, then Python will know while executing the class body exactly for what meta class it is intended to. And to give the meta class a say in what is going on with this uh, uh, execution, there's a special method for meta classes in Python 3 called dunder prepare, which l returns a mapping of any kind. So it can be an order preserving dictionary like data structure. Or it uh, basically lets you keep control, or it can be a special object which whenever something is assigned does something clever as a side effect, so you can have all sort of uh, tracing happen during the construction of your class, and so on and so forth. Uh, since uh, the meta class use is now so much more powerful, we've also managed, I think, to eliminate a lot of craft with another extremely simple idea, uh, which is to allow decorators to be used for class statement as well as def. So instead of you, a lot of stuff that you now would want to do with a meta class is basically equivalent of saying class blah blah, and then in the very end, blah blah equal do some changes on open paren blah blah close paren, and this is exactly the decorator pattern. And so finally, in Python 3000, it's taken as a while, uh, you can express that as uh, uh, <coughs> at blah blah before the class statement and the decoration will happen after the class statement. Uh, this, isn't basic, this isn't to supplement meta class powers. If you are using a meta class anyway, that's probably way plenty. It is basically to wipe away at least half of the cases in which you now have to use meta classes. So fewer meta classes, which can, if needed, be more powerful. Okay, and this concludes the brief excursus on the, on the object model. Uh, class creation. I have uh, some time reserved for question and answer at the end. If there's something extremely burning, just, just wave your hands and, and I'll try to do something about it. But otherwise, I just plan to proceed. Attribute lookup, just to fix our terms, I call it getting when you're doing x.foo or it's absolutely identical semantics, get after x uh, quote foo quote. It does exactly the same thing. Uh, and I call it setting when you do x.foo equal value, which is, again, identically equivalent to set after of x quote foo quote value. So, a little conundrum here. Okay, so we know the getting and the setting. So what's x.foo plus equal one? Is it a getting or a setting, something else? Anybody wanna try a guess? How would you find out? Well, the, in general, the best way to find things out in Python is to read the nutshell. But if you can't read the nutshell, then do a little bit of code and you'll easily find out because everything is so exposed. So I write myself a little class, new style of course, uh, with dunder get after and dunder set after, which will be invoked when attributes are gotten and set respectively. And they're pretty fake, as in uh, every attribute is claimed to be there with a value of 23, but the main thing is the side effect I want, which is to print get of the name. And even similarly for the set, I don't do actually do anything, but I print the fact that there's being a set of this name to this value. So then I instantiate that, and finally I try my x.foo plus equal one. Well, unsurprisingly, what x.foo plus equal one does is first it gets foo, gets 23, we know that, then it adds one, and then it sets foo to 24. So they, don't be tricked about that, the plus equal is first a getting followed by a setting. So the attribute must be defined before plus equal can run and gets reset after plus equal is done. Okay, so let's uh, get into getting. Um, all of this is implemented by a special method it's one of the few cases where I really wish Python did not expose one of his internals, 
please don't interfere with it. I've seen many people try to override under get attribute. I've never seen it done right, even once. I mean, sometimes it can be made to work, but it generally slows everything down so much uh, that you wish it didn't. So please don't do it. Um, so what does Dunder get attribute do for us? First of all, when, when we do x.foo, first of all, it checks, is the string foo in the type of x? By being in, I mean uh, attribute of the type. Um, or if not x itself, um, any of the uh, classes in the method resolution order, Dunder and Raw, uh, in, in order, so that's uh, all the uh, direct classes, uh, cl uh, base classes of base classes, and so on, arranged in a linear string. Uh, if it is there, then we ask, and we'll see what that means. Ooh, I've got a foo. Is that a descriptor? If it is a descriptor, then different rules apply, and we will see them later. If it's not a descriptor, put it aside for one moment, and remember you have it around. Then move on and check, is, it, uh, is the string a key in the dictionary or one of the slots of, uh, of uh, the class? If no, then remember the 112 step, were we there? Then did, did we stash something aside, then let's use that. Okay, none of this, if none of this is working, then you try dunder get utter if the class has one. And if everything else fails, you raise attribute error. So basically, all of these sequences are the first success is a return statement, takes you out of the sequence, with the one exception that if you found an object um, named foo but it's not a descriptor, then you need to keep it there for a second uh, because it will, it will be used only. Because basically, they, the one way of seeing it is uh, if, uh, if there's an object, uh, by the, an attribute of the name in the type, and it is a descriptor, then a set of rules applies. Otherwise, the, the, descript, the thing that is in the type but is not a descriptor can be um, overridden by it also being uh, in the instance dictionary or slot. Yes? At 1.1, <clears throat> what else could it be if it's not a descriptor? Anything except a descriptor. A descriptor is an object with a dunder get uh, special method. So we will, but you can have in the class, if your class has, um, as we had before, y equal 23, well then the class has an attribute y, that attribute y is an integer, an integer is not a descriptor. An integer is an integer, it doesn't have a dunder get method, so it's not a descriptor. Okay, so what's a descriptor? A descriptor is an object whose type has a special method dunder get. If it also has a dunder set, it used to be called a non-data descriptor. I think that's the terminology you'll find in the 2.4 documentation. Uh, it's now called a non-overriding descriptor, which is slightly more descriptive, because it's not so much about being data versus non-data. So basically, the priority in which an attribute value is solved is if the class has a data descriptor, then that is where the value's coming from. Otherwise, if the va specific variable is in the instance, that is typically in the dunder dict, then that is the result. Otherwise, a non-data descriptor if present will be used. Otherwise, a variable of the class if present, that wasn't a descriptor, will be used, and then finally, that's where you get to dunder get utter. So what do, does it mean to use a descriptor? Well, for example, if B is a type, then B foo means get the foo out typically of the dictionary, but it could be a base class equivalently, and then call dunder get with non and B. Instance non type B. If it's already an instance, so x dot foo where B is the type of x, then it's similar, but uh, you pass x as the instance and b as the type. How is the distinction brought about by the fact that the dunder get attribute in object gets overridden by the dunder get attribute in type? So that's one of the issues why it's not wise to, 
to further override android attribute. There's already two implementation. One is in every object except the types which have another. And that's why your meta class should normally inherit from type and not uh, try to redo everything. Uh, typical, then probably you must have written in your lifetime of Python use thousands of descriptors. You probably didn't realize it because functions are descriptors. In a Python-like implementation of functions, the, the function type, you'd have a dunder get, basically making the function a descriptor, not under set. It's a non-data, it's, it's a function, not data. Which basically builds a bound method, uh, calling types method type. Uh, the, the older way was uh, uh, new dot instance method, but uh, this is the preferred way, with uh, the, the function as, as infunc, and the object, which can be non for an unbound method, and, and the type. The other standard descriptor besides function, which are like obviously something you write every day, uh, the other standard descriptor that's quite important uh, are properties. Um, assume you are reasonably familiar with properties, so I'm just reminding you a property is something uh, with an init uh, where you can optionally set uh, functions for getting, setting, deleting, uh, and a doc string. Uh, and they all get recorded as self.fget and so on. And then on the dunder get, uh, um, it uh, basically doesn't do anything if called on the on the fun on the on the type. Uh, otherwise, it raises an error if it has no fget. Finally, it calls fget, and similarly for set. And the importance of properties, of course, is to dress up the call of functions as if it was an attribute access, so you can program something that relies on attribute access and then change the implementation and all the client code doesn't need to change. So that's very handy. Moving on to introspection, the key point I want to make, and I make every time I speak about introspection in Python, use the standard library module inspect. Somebody's already done all the work of doing all the possible introspection work on all kind of objects, uh, all kind of types, uh, and so on, and make them as available as very nice function, very nicely documented. Don't bother calling dir, calling vars, uh, uh, looking at dunder classes, looking at dunder bases. Uh, the inspect does just about anything you will ever want. I particularly recommend looking at this URL, uh, which is a very concise summary documentation of the internal types. Uh, if you didn't know what I was talking about, when earlier I said f dot func underline code, uh, func underline code is one of the attribute of functions. It's a code object that the function executes, and you find it in that very simple summary table on that URL. Uh, similarly, I've seen people called sys dot underline get frame. The underline is there to tell you not to. It means it's private. We had to stick it in sys to make inspect work. Use uh, all the functions that inspect makes available for proper, nice access to frame objects. Um, and of course, uh, also another thing I always, uh, always say uh, when, when talking about introspection, it's absolutely fine, it's the cat's pajamas for debugging, including uh, debugging performance problems, debugging memory leaks, as well as debugging functional problems. Uh, it may be useful for testing, although this is a bit edgy for me. Normally I prefer to be very explicit in my testing, but there are uh, third-party frameworks like Nose that use uh, introspection very effectively for, for testing. Uh, don't even think about it for production code, it's not. Uh, it, it, it's too rich. It, it makes production code very hard to debug and to maintain for anybody else. So to inspect objects, you typically use a get members function of, uh, of the inspect module, uh, possibly uh, with a second argument that's a predicate. Predicate means it will only bother returning the name value pair for 
members of OBJ that do satisfy that predicate. So it's a, basically a function taken as Boolean. Um, it supplies many to you. For example, say you want to know uh, all the classes defined in module foo. Well, you do that with inspect get members foo, uh, comma inspect dot uh, is class. That basically does the filtering for you. It's a very handy thing. Um, and then maybe on every class you want to know its inheritance tree. Uh, actually, you want to know the whole inheritance tree of all the classes you've just gotten. You just bump that into the get class tree, which basically studies all the um, inheritance relationship and structures. Uh, it basically takes the list of classes and returns a list of list of classes which describe all the inheritance relationships. Um, it gets a bit confusing in uh, multiple inheritance cases, but, but it still can be useful, and there's a, a pretty good recipe on the net to turn that into an ASCII graphic kind of thing to show you the, the inheritance relationship. Or if you just want to know how uh, base classes will be, will be walked, uh, then don't go and look at under MRO again. Use the inspect.getMRO um, of uh, function, which does it for you nicely. Uh, it also incredibly manages to work on, on old style classes if you have any around from ancient legacy code. Um, if you want to study a function, typically for debugging purposes, as I said, um, what's the exact signature of this function? What arguments does it take? And so on, get argspec uh, does great value for that. If you have a frame, which will mentioned shortly, uh, anyone, okay, so the function was called with what arguments again? Get arg values manages to explore the frame, get all the argument values corresponding to the various names for you and so on. And also, if you're writing a, a, a debugging friendly situation, you may want to look at uh, get source, um, which, for example, uh, if obj is a function, uh, they inspect get source, uh, will assume they're around somewhere, find the Python sources where the def statement for that function was located and, and return them as a list of lines. And there's, uh, uh, you can get the um, path to the file uh, and, and so on with other functions. Moving on to garbage collection, this is one point where I want to point out very intensely. Um, most of what I say about Python, although I keep focusing on, on C Python 2.4, also applies uh, to the three other big important implementation of Python. Jython, who's just out in 2.5 uh, and runs on the, on the Java virtual machine and is finally now supported by Sun Microsystems after all these years. Uh, um, Iron Python, which has been uh, supported as an official product by Microsoft for a while, and PyPy, which has now graduated from being a research project of the European community to a thriving open source commercial venture. Uh, but for garbage collection, there is absolutely no communality because Jython and Iron Python run on um, existing virtual machines and they basically, to play well with the rest of the ecosystem there, they need to use exactly whatever is provided for garbage collection by that virtual machine, which is typically the uh, mark and sweep generational uh, background thread and so on. But basically, the, the Python implementation there don't really worry about it, they just dump everything down to JVM and CLR, respectively. Uh, PyPy, one of the strengths of PyPy, is that it's got like half a dozen backends. You can generate uh, JavaScript to, to send to your browser. You can generate uh, bare machine code. Uh, you can generate just about anything. And so, of course, the garbage collection strategy is like totally different in every case. We'll cover CPython only here. I won't even mention again the rest. So the main strategy for um, CPython garbage collection is reference counting. Why reference counting, which is like an antediluvian technique? Because it frees everything it can as soon as it can with, it's maybe not minimal cost, but the cost is very nicely spread out in general. Um, it's not always feasible due to the garbage loops, and so we have a secondary fallback strategy, which is a generational mark and sweep, just three generations, but that's generally plenty. The, all the controls at your disposal to interact with that are in the standard library module GC. Um, it's, uh, you can 
re-enable enable and disable. You can force collection right now. You can check if it's currently enabled. You can set and get debug flags. You can set and get the thresholds for entering from one generation to the next. Uh, so how, how often is uh, a garbage collection cycle run for the youngest generation, for the middle generation, for the oldest generation? And give, you can basically get all the objects that are being tracked, a huge list. You can get the referrers for an object and the reference for an object, uh, which basically all helps you find uh, garbage loops, eliminate them for, for better performance. And there's dot garbage, which is basically where all the unreachable and collectible objects, objects which have the horrid thing known as a dunder dell, which is another thing that we should never have had. But, uh, or you can also put everything in there to help you find the reference loop uh, by the um, debug save or debug flag. Moving back on to introspection, stacks, frames, and trace packs. Standard library module inspect all, does almost all you need to help you with that. But here's a little extra understanding of what's going on in there. Again, it's absolutely priceless for debugging in depth, particularly if you have ever, um, ever using uh, C extensions to Python and you're, so basically you're having to look at uh, the Python data structure from GDB instead of PDB, GDB having absolutely no clue what's going on, it's not, it helps if you do. Uh, and occasionally for testing and uh, here's my standard disclaimers against using it in real life. So trace-based objects are what you find in the uh, third item of um, Xinfo. Uh, you can basically look at it as a simple collection of four attributes. Uh, it's no, got no methods, no nothing. Uh, so it points to a frame. It Within that frame, it says uh, where the index in the currently executing bytecode, where it stopped, uh, what's the corresponding line number in the Python source. Again, the, it's obviously helpful for debugging. And then there's a pointer to another traceback, which is the next one, meaning the next inner. So a traceback is essentially a, a linked list queue. The head is the uh, one that called, the one that called, the one that called, the one that called, the one where you finally got the exception. The formatting and analysis, particularly for display purposes of traceback, is better handled by the traceback module in stdlib, uh, in the standard library. Uh, you can use inspect, but traceback already does a lot of uh, heavy carrying for you, uh, so that's what you use. The frame objects, you can get from traceback that you can also get from uh, such function as get cur uh, current frame, uh, stack, uh, and so on. Uh, get inner frame, get outer frames, uh, which let you get all the frames uh, uh, that have called this one recursively, all the frames that are being called by this one recursively. It's got a lot of attributes, uh, all pre um, preceded by F underscore. Uh, that's a naming style of some very ancient Python object uh, that uh, kind of reminiscent of um, uh, struct objects in C before the ISO standard when the namespaces of different structs could be mixed. Uh, so uh, religiously, everybody always had uh, unique prefixes in their names inside structs. Anyway, uh, so all the exception information, if there is any, any exception being raised in, in that frame, um, a back pointer to the calling frame, not that trace backs point forward, frames point backward. That's the, a frame knows where it's been called from. A trace back knows what trace back object it caused to, to be created, so it called essentially. So basically we have two linked lists pointing in different direction and the trace back point to the frame. So that allows not perfect navigation, because if you start with a frame, you, uh, you basically, unless there's been an exception right there, in which case you can use the 
FXETB to get the trace back and then start navigating at will, uh, it's not immediately obvious. So essentially, whenever a function is called, uh, the, the call creates, activates, and links uh, one more frame at the top of the stack, uh, and the links go the other way. And finally, we get to speak about bytecode again. This is strictly C Python. Python you use as JVM bytecode, so that's a separate talk. I run Python uses a common language runtime of Microsoft. PyPy can use anything. There's a backend generating common Lisp, a, a backend supporting the LLVM, and so on and so forth. Um, I find looking at bytecode an extremely instructive exercise. Whenever I am not exactly sure what's going on. I'm not, I don't have a specific rigorous mental model of the execution of what will happen executing this piece of Python code. I disassemble it, and that teaches me all I need to know. Um, altering bytecode, on the other hand, is very much one of the things you should really never do except for like weird fun in your own time. Not, not for any production purposes. Just imagine debugging it if anything goes wrong. Eek! Anyway, the Python virtual machine is a very simple stack-oriented virtual machine with basically everything you would expect from a stack-oriented VM, plus a few very high-level opcode specialized to Python, like that build class one we saw earlier. Um, I'm assuming some familiarity with stack machines. Either you had a uh, HP RPM uh, reverse Polish calculator in your youth, uh, or worked in fourth, uh, or hacked on PostScript, uh, one of those beautiful reverse Polish stack oriented. I, I'm pretty sure you never programmed an actual stack machine because I don't think any has been built in the last 50 years. All the list of bytecodes are very clearly documented. I'm just summarizing here. The main alleged advantage of having a stack orientation rather than register is that a lot of operands can avoid bytecodes. Kind of, this compresses the, the structure a lot. So a lot have to do with stack manipulation. Uh, pop top, throw away the top of the stack. Uh, rot two, swap the two top elements of the stack and so on. There's plenty of those. And uh, operators, both unary and unary operate on top of stack and leave the result on top of stack. Binary operate on the top two, leave the result in their place. Uh, and the in-place ones also basically uh, work on the top of stack. And uh, instead of leaving the result there, presumably leave it stas uh, safely stashed in, in, in some object rather than in the stack. There's a lot of operator for slicing. For example, um, all the various forms of slices are represented by different operators rather than different arguments. Um, so there's a, for example, slice plus zero is the notation we use, is for colon among bracket. So when you do x bracket colon close bracket, that's a slice plus zero operator on x. So it would be load name x. Uh, Plus plus zero, plus one. Uh, I forget if plus one is a colon nothing or colon or nothing colon a. But anyway, there's all, all sort of uh, possibilities for slicings because you can have or not have each of start, stop, and step. So there's like eight, two to the third possibilities. There's eight operators, and again for the storing. So that's eight and eight sixteen. And there's, there's plenty of special purpose one, like print item is a, uh, equivalent to a print statement. Uh, uh, break loop uh, is obviously used to indicate the exit from a loop. Build class we've seen means, uh, OK, here we are, identify the meta class and call it a yield and return for generators and functions, respectively. And then we have some operands, some bytecode take operands, but operands in a rather specialized sense. The, you normally think of an operand as, say, the, I don't know, I do x times 1.1. Well, there's got to be some operator there with an operand of 1.1. Not exactly. Um, what happens is when Python compiles a function or something that is kind of like a function, like a class body, 
it builds a table of constants, like a table of variables. So, so the constant zero is always known. Suppose this is, uh, that 1.1 is the only other constant in this, it will become constant one. And so what is needed is uh, load name x, load constant one, load name x is, is actually load name zero, the first name in the function, and then uh, load constant one, the second constant in the function, and then binary multiply. So the operand is actually a small number. Almost invariably, two bytes are enough. So most uh, operands are two byte numbers. For those extremely rare cases where you need a number larger than uh, 65535, uh, there's an extended arg bytecode which basically takes and, and stashes away its operand, and then the next one comes and is combined to give a four byte operand. That's a very weird way to do some little bit of sparse optimization. So a lot of um, those load something, a constant name, uh, an attribute, a global. Uh, there's possibility of storing and deleting almost all of these, for example, not const. So there is a load const, there is no store const. The, con the concept would be contradictory. Uh, there are builds, like, which typically take the number of items to take from the stack to build a tuple, a list, and so on. There's a sort of flow control, jump conditional and unconditional, uh, setting up of loop except and finally construct, uh, making functions and closures, and so on. Um, this is what you want to use, and the format is very helpful. There's a line number, there's a marker if that is a target of a jump, uh, there's the address of the bytecode, the bytecode has code name, and the operand is shown both a numeric value and as the human readable thing. So we've seen some. This, this is what I mean when I say a little function becomes a lot of bytecode I had to switch to a smaller font because of that. This is very simple. If it's less than 23, uh, you'll see. This is where line two starts. This is where line three starts. Uh, these two lines are targets of jumps. And you see, this is jump forward to 25, and so on. So um, for example, all the comparison operation uh, are, are mapped into a single opcode, which is compare op. It's the operand that tells me which one. Uh, compare up zero is a less than operation. So I, I try to find some some sufficiently trivial example uh, of of use. I, I think this is a bit far fetched, but you know they you probably met this problem when you do minus two star star two and you get minus four. Wait a second, isn't the square of minus two four? Why minus four? This is a bug in Python, and this uh, is meant to illustrate not really. It, it, it basically does the minus six star star y, and it shows you what happened. Load x, load y, raise to power, and then negate. So basically, this is just a way of showing, oh yeah, the raise to power has higher priority than the unary minus, duh. What a design, oh well, sorry. It's, it's the way it was designed, and we're not going to change it anytime soon. Now, suppose you're pining for assembly. You say, ooh, that reminds me of when I was programming in, in, in bare machine code on my uh, hacked motherboard. I wish I could do something like that for Python. Well, you can't. Just don't put that in production. But uh, the probably best updated thing right now is a single huge Python module called BytePlay. Uh, so basically, you within that module, uh, you build a code instance. You passing you pass a real Python code object, and you get an instance of this class code. You manipulate it to your heart's content, and then you call to code, and it gives you back a code object. And it's basically a list of uh, tuples, each as uh, the opcode and the argument, or opcode none, if uh, if it has no argument. Um, uh, in addition to the real opcode, you can also have labels and set line numbers to do line numeration. And the wrapper is very nice. It's basically the same as this. 
And then all sorts of things that would be uh, read only in a real code object, uh, such as the list of names uh, for arguments, list of names for free variables, so the name itself, and so on, become read write. So you can reassign them and build up a code object as you wish. Uh, here's an example. So say we have a function which does a complex operation return x plus x. Well, we do a import byte play before, byte play code from code a fun code. This is what, I, what we print, as you see, it's like the dist is. It's a load fast, load fast, binary add return value. So now is where we turn ourselves into assembly programmers uh, and say, ooh, I can change this with a load constant 23. Yes, I can. And then with new function, with a new piece of code and empty globals dictionary and the name G, I can build a new function. Now G of 100 will give me, instead of 200, F200 would be, F, F of 100 would be 200. G of 100 will be 123. Because I have built a function that does load fast takes, load const 23, binary add, and return value. The much older and richer Unfortunately, it's old enough that it doesn't support any Python 2 something. It's Python 152 only. Nobody's ever bothered to port it. It's uh, Michael Hansen bytecode hacks, which in addition to the uh, code objects that you work at the level of uh, uh, function objects, method objects, uh, um, and it, uh, it does a lot of cool stuff for you, including a small but funny peephole optimizer that the people optimization is now in, <coughs> in part of the official Python. I, I must say that uh, doing serious optimization on that bytecode, the bytecode is so high level, that there's not all that much you can do. But what little can be done, for example, um, computing constants such as compile time rather than the runtime is now embedded in Python. So if you write two plus, uh, return two plus two is actually compiled as the same way as return four. So there's not much request for that. And we have five minutes for Q&A. And this is again is the URL from which you can get the, the slides. So anybody's got any questions? Yes. Um, uh, you said earlier that uh, git adder is identical to, or like, you know, git adder. Yes. The um, built in function git adder, uh, called with a constant, is identical to doing the dot constant on the object. It's semantically identical. Doesn't mean, okay. doesn't mean it's. It's like saying that uh, um, that uh, uh, x uh, star star two is identical to x time x. Yes, but I'm not saying which one will be faster. Okay. Measure it with uh, time it. It's a time it is a precious resource. Whenever you're wondering about saving a microsecond or a nanosecond here and there. Um, because it basically answers uh, uh, exactly how fast is this construct on this specific version of Python on this specific machine. So it's uh, not just a generic, well, in general, star star two tends to have a tiny more overhead, but then again, it depends because you're only fetching a variable x once. Right. Okay. So it's kind of, uh, yes. What does time it? Sorry, so, so time it shuts off the garbage collector. Oh, yeah. So if you have a lot of object creation, it doesn't give you exactly the right impression. Yes, that is correct. Time it is designed f for timing small snippets in some uh, un unprecise sense, not, not for timing a big thing. It's not a general purpose load testing framework. It's a really micro benchmark. Well, no more questions? Then we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you.